Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about uh, interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, especially with respect to uh, pathogenesis and possible uh, treatment options. I will go over certain things that might be well known to you, but hopefully I'll put them into a different perspective to allow me to eventually give uh, some advice at the end. Um, some years ago, uh, Dr. Christian Whitmore and I published uh, a paper in the Journal of Family Practice about how to suspect interstitial cystitis. And we decided to publish it in that journal because we believed that many general practitioners and family medicine uh, colleagues should be aware of interstitial cystitis. In that paper, of course, you can see the bladder being inflamed, and we will talk about uh, the bladder in a few minutes. But it is important to note that I see is often comorbid with other diseases. In other words, patients do experience other diagnoses, most of them quite painful in their own right, uh, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and vulvodynia, and I'm sure there will be many others. And with this uh, caricature of the bladder, I want to indicate what I will reiterate later, that the bladder lining is protective and protects the muscle, the detrusor muscle, and it protects the nerve endings that are actually embedded. And the bladder lining is made up primarily of negatively charged molecules, especially chondroitin, sulfate, and hyaluronate. And therefore, if those are damaged, then molecules inside the urine will go through the cracks in the bladder wall, and it will irritate the muscle and eventually the sensory nerve endings causing pain. In another paper uh, we had published also some years ago, we created a list of what might potentially be abnormalities in the bladder, such as, as I said, the bladder lining. There could be also problems in the ascending and descending nerve pathways. There could be neurogenic inflammation, meaning inflammation in the bladder that also affects the nerves. There could be neurohormonal dysregulation, meaning sex hormones and other neuropeptides, especially those released under stress, could be affecting the bladder function. There could be inability to repair damage on the wall of the bladder, and of course the comorbid conditions that I already quickly mentioned. Now, since that time, over the last 15 years or so, many papers have been written about possible inflammatory mediators in the bladder, as you can see at the top, as well as what we call oxidative stress biomarkers. And whenever we have inflammation, we also have oxidative stress. Other papers looked at cytokine and chemokines. These are molecules involved in inflammation. And most recently by my colleague, uh, Rob Baldwin, a paper on immune cell profiles and other molecules in IC. And I'm showing in the right hand side a graph from that paper indicating concentrations of two pro-inflammatory molecules, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor, to which we will return a couple of times uh, shortly. And they indicated the levels in healthy individuals uh, as well as those that had ulcers and non-ulcers. And as you can see, the results varied. Uh, so even though interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha could in fact be increased in IC, they're not always increased and different conditions might also affect their levels there. So the take home message from this slide is in spite of many papers, we still do not have specific markers for inflammation and we do not have specific objective markers to make a diagnosis of this condition. 
Now, what was music to my ears was this paper that was published very recently in August 2022, showing that many individuals with IC had food sensitivities. And it so happened that two other important papers were published also within the last year or so. One was published in the journal Nature, where they indicated that immune responses to food antigens could induce abdominal pain. And an editorial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about this Nature paper. And you can see the caricature, a must cell, a unique immune cell, in this case in the gut, but it would also be in the bladder, releasing molecules such as histamine, sensitizing nerve endings. And as the editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine wrote, an allergic basis for abdominal pain. And most recently, a paper was published where they tried anti-inflammatory diet for women with IC, and they found that adhering to an anti-inflammatory diet was actually quite helpful in most of the subjects participating. And what we mean by anti-inflammatory diet is diet that is devoid of molecules that might induce inflammation. And one of the most important such molecules is histamine. So you can see two papers about histamine and what we call histamine intolerance or biogenic amines. That means primarily histamine in various foods. And quickly I will indicate that foods that are rich in pro-inflammatory molecules, especially histamine, are ripe avocado, cheeses, nectarines, sardines, spinach, spices, ripe tomato, uh, and tuna. So therefore, before we even talk about objective findings or possible treatments, we should be aware of the fact that foods rich especially in histamine and other molecules that can cause inflammation could result in abdominal pain and potentially pelvic pain uh, as well. Based on such findings, many years ago, we made the hypothesis that this unique immune cell called the mast cell may be involved in a number of conditions that include pain, and many of which, as I already indicated, can be comorbid in the same patients, meaning they can coexist in the same patients. So you can see multiple chemical sensitivity, food allergies, interstitial cystitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, now long COVID or post-COVID syndrome, fibromyalgia, autism that I will not talk about today, allergy and asthma, and Lyme disease or post-Lyme syndrome. So I'd call this atopic conditions in search of pathogenesis and therapy. And I use the word atopic because that's a broader term than allergy, meaning the mast cells are ready to fire to numerous triggers, as we will see, without someone being specifically allergic in the true sense of the word. So most recently, we published a review about how mast cells can participate in neuroinflammation and pain, especially in fibromyalgia syndrome. And as a diagram taken from this uh, journal, we try to indicate that mast cells in the periphery can sensitize nerve endings and send messages to the brain, but also mast cells in the brain can talk to the defenders of the brain microglia and cause them to release molecules that can affect the sensitivity of pain centers in the brain, especially the thalamus and hypothalamus. And in fact, as I already indicated, there are many pain syndromes that are comorbid with fibromyalgia, of course, interstitial cystitis being one of them, but also myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder, muscle activation disorder, irritable bowel syndrome, etc. And in fact, two recent uh, papers spoke about mast cells in neuropathic pain. And as you know already, neuropathic pain is a pain that is not absolutely precise. So we have neuropathic pain, we have bladder pain, but we also feel it in other parts of the abdomen or the pelvis. 
and vice versa. Usually neuropathic pain can travel about three vertebra up our spinal cord. Therefore, it is not, as I said, precise. And an editorial uh, also recent talking about mast cells, pain, and itch, and how neuroinflammation is involved. And this kind of pain might also be potentially uh, involved in vulvodynia, to which I will return. Now, we were among the very first to indicate or suggest that interstitial cystitis might be a neuroimmunoendocrine disorder. What does that mean? That it involves components of the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system. And we specifically focused on this immune cell, the mast cell. Firstly, because as you can see in the rectangle, mast cells contain and release many neurosensitizing mediators. In other words, mediators that can cause pain. And we will speak quite a bit of this particular molecule called substance P. But mast cells release also molecules that make the blood vessels leaky and allow other immune cells from the circulation to come into the area and cause inflammation. And some of those molecules uh, include vascular endothelial growth factor, about which I will discuss as well. But one of the first papers we published, we looked for the number of mast cells in transitional carcinoma of the bladder, as well as interstitial cystitis. And the total number of mast cells as compared to control, as you can see on the left-hand side, was high in both bladder cancer and interstitial cystitis. What was uniquely different as shown in the red rectangle was that the number of mast cells in bladder cancer were not activated while in interstitial cystitis were very activated. What does activated mean? If you look at the right-hand side from our laboratory, this is electron micrograph magnified about 3,000 diameters. And you see a mast cell in the bladder. You see the roundest area is a nucleus and all the granules are intact granules. A mast cell contains about 1,000 such secretory granules, each one of which contains about 50 biologically active molecules. But in interstitial cystitis, shown at the bottom part of this uh, graph, you can see that the nucleus, again, it's in the middle, but most of the granules have released their contents. So this is an activated mast cell. In fact, in Europe, urologists count the number of mast cells and their activation in the detrusor muscle as part of the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis, and they call that actually bladder mastocytosis. Now, what is a mast cell? Again, just this is a caricature of a cell. As I said, if you look at the left-hand side of the bottom, it contains about 1,000 secretory granules. The sort of white is empty areas of the nucleus. But if the mast cell is activated in allergy or anaphylaxis through the immunoglobulin E binding on receptor showing at about 11 o'clock, the mast cell explodes like a hand grenade and releases most of its contents, as you can see at the very left-hand side. But the mast cell contains numerous other receptors. You can see at about 12 o'clock, a receptor that is activated by positively charged molecules. And on the left-hand side, you see two papers where this particular receptor seems to be linked to the Ig receptor. So the cell is very dynamic talking to its other receptors. And on the right hand side, you can see receptors at about one o'clock for peptides such as substance P, and about two o'clock about molecules released from other immune cells called interleukins, and also receptors that are stimulated by bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Now, a major difference between the Ig receptor and this other receptor for positively charged molecules in all the receptors and many others on the right hand side is that the Ig receptor and the receptor for positively charged molecules 
causes the granulation and release of molecules immediately within a few minutes, such as histamine, of course, platelet and activating factor, tumor necrosis factor, and proteolytic enzymes such as kinase and reptase. In contrast, when the receptors on the right-hand side are activated, there is no degranulation, and instead, the muscle releases molecules that are all pro-inflammatory, such as interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6. I've already mentioned those as molecules that have been identified in the bladder, and also peptides that are very pro-inflammatory, such as bradykinin, hemokinin-1, which is very similar to substance B, and VEGF. And if you were now to look at the electron micrograph, again at the left, uh, side of the bottom. Now you see granules that are changing, but the mast cell doesn't explode. So the mast cell, both biochemically and morphologically, can be separated at least in two types of activation, the one known to occur in allergy and the one known to occur in inflammation. And it is mostly the inflammatory type of mast cell activation that we see in interstitial cystitis. But mast cells also communicate with nerves. At the top, we published a paper where you see in the blue box, the vertical line is a blood vessel, the diagonal line is actually a nerve ending, and the mast cell is sitting literally on a nerve ending. At the right hand side from our laboratory, it's 300,000 diameters magnified electron micrograph. At the top, you see part of a mast cell with some granules. At the bottom left, another mast cell with some granules. And N is the terminus of a nerve. And the little arrows indicate the synaptic vesicles that release neurotransmitters through which we can communicate. But as I already told you, the mast cell granules contain numerous molecules that are neurosensitizing, so you can imagine how the mast cell will affect this nerve ending and vice versa. At the bottom, we also published a paper where we showed a unique form of communication between mast cells and neurons called nanotubes. And as you can see at the green uh, colored rectangle, you can see these long processes. These are nanotubes emanating from mast cells in culture, touching, communicating with cultured neurons. And you can see on the right-hand side, you can see the content inside the nanotubes moving from a mast cell to its neuron. So both in terms of proximity, as well as nanotube formation, the mast cells communicate with nerves, especially sensory nerves. And in fact, numerous papers have published how neurokinin-1 receptors, which are stimulated by substance B, are required for antigen-induced cystitis. Neurokinin receptors in a CAT model of interstitial cystitis, how molecules such as bradykinin and substance B released from mast cells can induce neurotransmission in the bladder through another type of receptors called purinergic receptors and how local anesthesia can actually reduce levels of substance B in interstitial cystitis. In fact, we published papers where we showed that substance B positive nerve fibers in the bladder in interstitial cystitis, as you can see, these are nerve fibers at the top, and now the brown, brownish fibers at the bottom communicate basically with mast cells showing kind of redis in this double staining picture. Other colleagues showed that there is gene expression in mouse bladder induced by lack of polysaccharide from bacteria and how substance B is involved and how sensitization of pelvic nerves induce mast cell infiltration in the urinary bladder as well as in the colon uh, and how these are mediated by neuropeptides. The reason I'm stressing these findings is because in spite of the fact that this paper was published as far as back as 1995, we still have not explored the possibility 
of how to block such interactions as a way of treating interstitial cystitis. So back in early 2000, we wrote another review among many about how mast cell might participate in interstitial cystitis. And we included the different types of evidence. So there was light and electromicroscopy of infiltration of mast cells, staining with triptase, which is unique only to the mast cells, measurement of various mediators, such as histamine, triptase, et cetera, in the urine from animals in which we had induced cystitis, how the muscles communicate with sensory neurons, and how mast cell activation and other overlapping conditions uh, can occur. So we had created this rubric that if there is damage to the urothelium that protects the bladder, muscles will be activated, and the so-called C fibers in sensory nerves can be stimulated and we call upregulated, meaning they're now ready to fire. Once we have that, in the spinal cord that carries the messages to the brain can be what we call a wind up, meaning the sensory nerves are already now wound up and ready to be firing all the time. And since, as I said earlier, the visceral organs are not sensing pain precisely, that's what we call neuropathic pain or hyperalgesia in allodynia. Now we can have pain sensation in the urinary bladder, the gynecologic organs, pelvic floor, as well as GI. Therefore, you can see how we can have comorbidities by other conditions where the diagnosis might be different, but the bottom line might still be hyperalgesia due to this particular sequence of events. But I have to also stress that mast cells can respond to heavy metals, such as mercury and aluminum, can respond to herbicides, such as atrazine and glyphosate, and all of those, of course, find their way in the urine. So once the mast cells are exposed in the bladder lining, any such molecules in the urine will trigger them, and this will be a dynamic process where triggers will continue to trigger the mast cells, the muscle will be sensitizing nerve endings, and you will have a continuous neuroinflammation in the bladder. And so far, as we return many times and again, we have not addressed neuroinflammation in the bladder as a way of treating interstitial cystitis. The mast cells also communicate with other cells and pathogens, such as macrophages, which are of course found uh, in the bladder, T cells that are involved in a number of conditions, especially viral infections. And I chose three papers to show on the right-hand side, where Borrelia, which of course is the cause of Lyme disease, can stimulate mast cells to release only cytokines, no degranulation. Sporothric, which is a kind of mold that releases mycotoxins, again, can stimulate mast cells to release interleukin-6 and TNF, that I already told you are potential biomarkers in the bladder, but no degranulation. And most recently, it was shown that the coronavirus spike protein can stimulate TLR receptors to release inflammatory cytokines. I will return this to the very end. But as you can see in the red, the red box in this caricature, the mast cells express all toll-like receptors. Therefore, any bacteria such as Borrelia, any mold or mycotoxins, uh, or even coronavirus, can find its way into the bladder and stimulate mast cells and other immune cells. Now, what is the mast cell? So we wrote this review in the New England Journal of Medicine many years ago, and I was grateful to the journal because they allowed us to use the word mast cells mastocytosis, which is a condition with many mast cells, but also related disorders. And as you can see in this caricature taken from the journal, in addition to allergens, which are not even shown in this caricature, numerous drugs, peptides, cytokines, and environmental triggers can stimulate the mast cell. So we have the primary mast cell diseases, such as mastocytosis, too many mast cells, we have the secondary mast cell activation diseases, such as allergies, 
uh, where the carrier is upon pressure. Um, and then we have the so-called idiopathic conditions, where you might have anaphylaxis or angioedema or itching or other conditions such as mast cell activation syndrome, which are not typically allergies. And in fact, some of my co-authors from the New England Journal of Medicine wrote in their own right the definition of another condition called mast cell activation syndrome. So we have allergies, fairly succinct. There were atopic conditions, which is a little broader. And there were mast cell activation syndrome, which in some ways is even broader. So therefore, what can activate the mast cells in the bladder could be due to numerous conditions and not necessarily just allergies. In fact, chronic psychological stress has been shown to affect the bladder and both in animal models and in humans, as we will see, can increase reactivity of mast cells and symptomatology. You can see cold restrained stress could actually uh, damage the urinary bladder. We published a paper about stress-induced bladder mast cell activation and how that might be involved in interstitial cystitis. And most recently, we published how psychological stress can affect the mast cells. Therefore, when we talk about stress affecting diseases, specifically interstitial cystitis, we don't mean to say, oh, it's only your mind going to see a psychiatrist. We have specific molecular events. We know exactly uh, what happens. For instance, even though we think that corticotropin releasing hormone, abbreviated as CRH, is released only in the brain, and stimulates what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, we show that CRH levels are actually increased in the blood of patients with psoriasis, as you can see in the right-hand side graph, even higher in patients with psoriasis that have severe symptoms and in atopic dermatitis. You can see in the middle panel, daily stress affects and exacerbates interstitial cystitis patients. And at the bottom, how stress and symptoms in patients with interstitial cystitis can actually trigger or exacerbate all of the symptomatology. And then again, unfortunately, to this day, we are not paying attention to these findings as a way of treating interstitial cystitis. What is also quite amazing is that prenatal stressors, while the baby is still in the womb, can actually affect the outcomes in the child. You can see prenatal maternal stress can make actually the child develop atopic diseases. In the middle panel, the newborn child can develop atopic dermatitis. And at the bottom, regardless when the stress has occurred in terms of trimesters, it can affect the baby in terms of at least having atopic dermatitis. But other papers have shown that these are true in humans especially as it relates to the bladder. At the top, you see how acute stress and corticotropin-releasing hormone can induce actually vascular endothelial growth factor release in bladder explants, meaning we can actually see how this stress protein can stimulate release of molecules that can cause vasodilation and therefore set the stage for inflammation. You can see in the middle panel, how corticotropin releasing hormone can activate receptor two. There are two different receptors, one and two. And how, as you can see here, if in animals there is actually a condition where we knock out these receptors, meaning genetically the animals do not have these receptors, the CRH stop one receptor didn't make any difference for the animal who was stressed in terms of extravasation of a particular guy called Evans Blue, when the animals were knocked out for the type two receptor, stress could not actually induce extravasation. There was no difference between control and stress, as you can see. And at the bottom, you see a double insult, they call it, of neonatal cystitis plus adult inflammation, how that is also dependent on CRAs acting through type 2 receptors. So we were the first to show, in fact, 
that unlike what we thought that only the brain makes CRH, here we see that the mast cells, human culture mast cells, can actually make not only CRH as the left-hand side, which acts through type 1 receptors, but it can also make urocortin at the right-hand side, which acts through type 2 receptors. And you can see that the human mast cells not only make CRH and urocortin, but they express receptors for these molecules, as you can see in the green panel, by using fluorescent antibodies, recognizing the receptors on the surface of the mast cells. And when we add CRH, you can see the right-hand side, the flat line, no histamine is released, but the upgoing line shows that vascular endothelial growth factor is released. And what is also very important is that the mast cells, again, are very dynamic cells. You see at the bottom that substance P that we've already shown is present and increased in the bladder in interstitial cystitis can make the mast cells grow more receptors for CRH, and CRH makes the mast cells grow more receptors for substance P, making a cyclic continuous, basically inflammatory process. And again, we have not been addressing this neuroinflammatory process in our efforts to treat interstitial cystitis. Furthermore, we showed that CRH with another peptide released under stress called neurotensin can also make the skin increase vascular permeability, just like the bladder. We published this in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Now again, your attention makes muscles grow CRH receptors and vice versa. And if we add an interleukin called alarmin released from various immune cells, together with substance P to the mast cells, they release even more VEGF. And at the bottom, a recent paper where they showed that in mastocytosis patients, VEGF and other such molecules are better indicators of severity of disease than even histamine or the unique enzyme tryptase. And going back to neonatal life, here is neonatal bladder inflammation, alters actually the part of the brain called amygdala that defines basically behavior and causes hypersensitivity to stress due to shock. Another paper showed that prenatal negative life events, in other words, stressors, even increased the Ig in the blood that is involved in allergic reactions and a very important paper published in the journal Science about a year ago, they showed that the mast cells in the growing fetus can respond in this particular case to IgE circulating in the mother, but also might be responding to other triggers circulating in the mother, affecting the developing organs, whether it's the bladder or the brain. And finally, Two very important papers we published both in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences at the top and the bottom, where we showed at the top that substance P together with interleukin-33 can increase thousands of units of tumor necrosis factor and gene expression thereof, while the bottom hundreds of units of interleukin-1-beta. And just to remind you, both of these molecules were actually indicated as being elevated in the bladder of interstitial cystitis patients. And the middle paper in the red shows that when the muscles are activated, they release a molecule called hemokinin-1 that is very similar to substance P. Now, this molecule acts back on the mast cells and makes them become even more responsive to allergic triggers. And in fact, interleukin-6 not only reflect mast cell activation, as you can see in the three top papers from three individual laboratories, but interleukin-6 promotes mast cells to grow. And if they have a unique mutation on the surface called d 816 vkin mutation, these mast cells make interleukin-6 all the time. So I hope that all these findings indicate that the mast cell can play a major role 
in inflammation, in neuroinflammation, and especially in the bladder. Therefore, it is critical to try to inhibit the mast cell and inhibit the subsequent neuroinflammation. So as a summary up to this point, the mast cells respond to neuroimmunoendocrine triggers. As you can see, neural triggers, endocrine immune triggers, and we and others have written many papers indicating that the mast cells are involved in inflammation and not only in allergy. Now, recent papers, all published in 2022, did exceptional work in trying to identify yet new markers for interstitial cystitis. And even though they did, none of these findings are useful in terms of either objective diagnosis and or treatment. So they used a technique called single cell RNA sequencing to find out if there are actually differences. The important thing is that the differences were actually all related to immunity. They call it immune landscape. In the middle, they looked at peptides. So RNA is what makes the peptides. And they found certain peptides uh, in interstitial cystitis patients. But those peptides were not actually sufficient for diagnosis. And at the bottom, they looked again for potential adhesion molecules, meaning molecules that allow immune cells to bind uh, to blood vessels and come out and cause inflammation. They did identify two peptides, but then again, none of this is sufficient for either objective diagnosis or sufficient targets for treatment. So going back to the paper we published with Christy Whitmore, we indicated then that there may be a rubric that we can follow. I will not bother you with the exact uh, rubric other than say that there could be oral treatments and intravesical treatments, which of course we all know. And back then we had indicated certain drugs such as amitriptyline, such as hydroxyzine, such as pentosan polyphosphate, <coughs> as well as certain potential molecules or drugs for pain control. Now, the reason I'm stating this is because that was published 2011. And to this date, we're still dealing with the same molecules, except for a couple that I will mention. So we can give amitriptyline, we can give the antihistamine hydroxyzine, back to some polyphosphate has serious problems that we'll go over a little later. So it's probably being abundant. And then intravesical treatments, none of which is really lasting. So we're still, unfortunately, 20 years later, still scratching the surface on how to objectively diagnose and treat interstitial cystitis. And we had published a paper again years back in terms of how my consider treating interstitial cystitis. And as you can see the caricature at the right-hand side, we separated the groups of molecules in three categories. Those that can replenish the bladder lining, such as chondroitin sulfate, heparin, hyaluronic acid, and as I said, pentosan polysulfate, and I have uh, a thunderbolt there because, as I said, there are problems with it. Or we can go in terms of the nerve endings and the hypersensitivity of nerves, such as amitriptyline, gabapentin, and tramadol, and then molecules that might affect inflammation in mast cells, such as chondroitin sulfate, hydroxyzine, quercetin, and the like. So I'm a proponent because I've seen so many atopic-like comorbidities to propose, to recommend that we consider seriously adding antihistamine to patients with interstitial cystitis. Or which antihistamine? As you can see at the box on the left-hand side, there are many antihistamines. We've used hydroxyzine over the years because it is slightly anti-anxiety, and I've already indicated that stress can do a job, basically, in your inflammation of the bladder. And I would like to stress one antihistamine that is called rupatadine that is not available in the United States. It's been available in Europe for 20 years, in Canada now for about three years, and US-based physicians can write a prescription and the Canadian online pharmacist will send it to the patients in the United States. The reason I like rupatadine 
is of course an excellent antihistamine. It's also a mast cell stabilizer. As you can see, at two papers at the bottom uh, published from my laboratory, rupatadin could inhibit mast cell stimulation by any trigger. We had to try different stimuli, as well as by a molecule called PAF, platelet activating factor, as you can see on the right hand side. PAF is released by many cells as well as the mast cells and can affect many different processes in many different organs. It can cause itching, it can sensitize nerve endings, and it can induce inflammation. Unfortunately, PAF is not easily measured in clinical laboratories. That's why we haven't paid attention to it. But my goodness, if we have a drug that can act as an antihistamine, block PAF and block mast cells, we have three birds with one stone. So I'm a great proponent of considering rupatidine. Now, a recent paper was published in the Urologic Clinics of North America uh, this year, 2022. And as you can see in the gray box, we're really nowhere. We're still talking, as you can see, about amitriptyline, hydroxyzine, and then drugs such as cyclosporin that we didn't actually touch unless it's absolutely mandatory. Still talking about pentosome polysulfate has horrible problems. Intravesical therapy is just like what I mentioned before. And the only new drug is an intradetrusor injection of a particular molecule uh, for very refractory symptoms, which is still under uh, investigation, actually. Now, what is horrifying is that so many patients have been taking pentosal polysulfate, known as Elmiron over the years, and there are now numerous papers about maculopathy, meaning the macula that is very important for our being able to see gets damaged. And as you can see at the bottom, maculopathy is secondary to chronic use of pentosal polysulfate. So the longer you've been taking the drug, the more likely you might develop actually uh, uh, vision problems. So where are we? 20 years later, we're still talking about the same molecules, potentially one new drug for very severe symptoms which is actually injectable. So I would like to bring what I've been telling you together vis-a-vis -vis COVID and finish up with a few suggestions. As you can see on the left-hand side at the corner, during the COVID pandemic, there's no question that patients with the had interstitial cystitis or irritable bowel syndrome uh, felt actually worse. And as you can see in the box on the right-hand side, taken from the summary from this uh, paper, I see problems were actually worse. Uh, and this was also confirmed by urogynecologic uh, evaluation. So clearly either the virus itself and or the stress related to COVID-19 made patients worse. So we published a number of papers, one of which is shown at the lower left-hand side. And the diagram in the middle is taken from this paper. And we said basically, that at least in the lungs, we know the mast cells are there, they participate in asthma. So if there were at least mediators that could cause edema, fibrosis, inflammation, microclots. And in fact, all of this can happen in the bladder as well. And I'm preparing a review right now about how COVID-19 and especially the coronavirus can affect all these processes in the bladder. But to summarize the findings, there is clear evidence that rupatidine, histamine 1 receptor antagonist, can be beneficial. How famotidine, which is found in pepsin, a histamine 2 receptor antagonist, can be beneficial. Vitamin D3 has anti allergic properties. And luteolin, which is a flavonoid very similar actually to quercetin, can inhibit release of histamine and other mediators from mast cells. If you were compare it to the so-called drug mast cell stabilizer chromalin, you can see luteolin at two different concentrations can inhibit release of histamine from human culture mast cells much better. And in fact, we published a paper with successful treatment of a very severely affected COVID-19 patient by addressing mast cell activation and using a combination of these molecules shown in the green box 
and turn this patient around. So here's my last uh, slide. I want to, first of all, consider treatment recommendations from I experienced and from the literature. How can we address bladder inflammation? Well, we mentioned hydroxyzine as potentially being a helpful histamine one receptor antagonist that might also have anti-anxiety effects. I mentioned rubatadine, but we published a paper in a dietary supplement, Cystoprotec, uh, back in 2008, where we used it in refractory interstitial cystitis with very significant uh, benefit. Uh, this is to protect, is made by the company Algonaut. And it is very important to mention that both the ingredients in this dietary supplement, as well as the ability to allow the supplement ingredients to be absorbed because they're formulated in all of poma soil, has made a difference. There have been thousands of people uh, using Sister Protect over the years. In terms of pain, of course, you can use amitriptyline, gabapentin, pregabalin, and tramadol, which is like an opioid, but it has very different uh, properties, and you don't get addicted to it as easily. About 20 to 30% of people with interstitial cystitis have vulvodynia. One can use a gentle derm lotion that was also created by uh, Algonaut. This lotion contains an even more potent flavonoid than either quercetin or luteolin called tetramethoxyluteolin. And the reason why we chose that particular flavonoid is because quercetin and luteolin are yellow, therefore it would be very difficult to be using it in a skin lotion, while tetramethoxyluteolin does not have color and therefore was put into this uh, lotion. We already published a paper shown at the bottom where this particular lotion was very well tolerated and had a very strong benefit, especially in atopic dermatitis. In vulvodynia, one can use the well-known solar cane that we can use after basically sunburn because it contains a soothing moieties as well as a local anesthetic. And one can use doxepin, an old antidepressant, which also exists as a cream, 5% cream. The original cream had the name Zonalone, but now it's generic. It is very important in my mind to reduce stress. I usually recommend ashwagandha, which is a herb uh, uh, at about 500 milligrams uh, per day. In patients that do not have asthma, one can use the old antihypertensive drug propranolol. We often use it also in hyperthyroidism to decrease basically the, uh, the pulse. And of course, you can use benzodiapines like lorazepam. I like lorazepam because it acts within an hour and it's out of your system within three to four hours, unlike other drugs such as Valium that can last 12 hours. And then we have intravesical uh, treatments that can either use all of those molecules indicated or a combination of some of those, such as bicarbonate to change the acidity of the urine, chondroitin, halronate, and of course the local uh, drug lidocaine. So I want to leave you with this basically slide and this, these treatment recommendations, because as you see, these are very different in many ways than what had been tried in the past, but I believe their combination is likely to be much more successful. So we have to start with addressing comorbidities, especially allergies or atopic problems by using the antihistamines that I mentioned, hydroxyzine or butadine. Absolutely address the inflammation because we don't have any other uh, ways to do that, such as by using Cystoprotect. Whatever medications or supplements can change the acidity of the bladder content, those will be, of course, important. We have to address the pain, but if we only use pain medications, we scratch the surface because we address the symptoms. It's very important to address the cause of the pain, which I believe strongly, it is neuroinflammation. So moving forward, what should we be doing? 
First of all, I think it is almost silly to be looking for single biomarkers. What we have to create is what we call biosignatures. In other words, select those biomarkers that in individual studies have been shown to have actually promise and create a signature, meaning measure the levels and the expression of all of them together and see how significantly it helps us diagnose patients. Number two, we have to think outside the box. We'll be using the same treatments, same, if you wish, molecules, same supplements for almost 20 years. So since we haven't had any success, we have to think entirely outside the box. For that, of course, we all require funding. NIH was wonderful in giving a lot of funding many years ago, and this is how I had been involved in numerous of both clinical and basic science studies, but there hasn't been enough recent finding in terms of what might be potentially funded. So if we don't have recent findings, then we have to actually get new funding to try to come up with new biomarkers that might also constitute targets for new treatments. In the meantime, we have to use these combined approaches. And you might ask, for how long do we use those? We've been using some of these approaches for 20 years, and we've turned the life of many patients around. Can we do any better? Sure, we can do better. And I've had the opportunity to work with Algonaut to create some of these supplements, and we're actually creating an additional supplement that might be available on our Christmas time that will have two new properties. One will be helping wounds heal. In other words, if there are ulcers in the bladder, will be helped to heal. And number two, it will be desensitizing nerve endings. And hopefully that, we haven't decided on a name yet, will be used in combination with the system protect that has been used for many, many years and the gentle derm that recently have been used for vulvodynia with considerable success. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I truly believe that we will be doing much better in the future if we all work together.